part one of the conversation is on my YouTube page. But I do want to start here. I'd love for you both to address this. When the show was going off air, we had a little bit of conversation uh, when we were off air. And one of the things you said, Miss Miss Leslie, that I thought was really powerful. You said, you know, thank you for covering this because, you know, many um, outlets haven't spoken to uh, the black voices of Jonestown have been silenced. And you said they just thought we were a bunch of black people in the jungle uh, who just died. We were just dumb black folks in the jungle that we died following this uh, this uh, white man. Can you speak to how over the years that when you see these documentaries, you see predominantly white people. I had so many folks reach out to me saying, mm -hmm. I had no idea that it was majority black women and children. Mm -hmm. I had no idea he had all these black followers. I had no idea the racial implications here. So we can start with you, Miss Leslie. Just speak to over the years, 30, over 30 mm -hmm. some years, how the black voices of Jonestown, the most important voices have been mm -hmm. silenced. I think part of it is just the media has focused on white people and they thought it was a bunch of, you know, a lot of ignorant black folks that died in the jungle that didn't have anything else. Um, and it's continued every documentary, basically, um, you'll see me, you'll see Yolanda, you might see another uh, black person, but you know, it's, it's drowned down to two minute, you know, sound bites. And so I just think that it goes to, you know, white privilege um, and the fact that they just want to focus on those that were white. It's not ever been until one other, you know, I, I was sharing with that a, a radio host in North Carolina had me on. That was in 2009. Since then, they, it's almost it's almost as if they're embarrassed. Um, our people are embarrassed to, to talk about the story. So that's why I commend you for bringing this on. But it's always been that way. They just feel like we really, we really didn't count. We really didn't matter. Mm. And Yolanda, if you could speak to that as well, too. I mean, your story, uh, we, we, you explained it on, on two weeks ago, was so powerful. I mean, you were a huge part of some lives being saved, uh, but yet that's not the narrative that you hear at all. Speak to me about the Black voices of, of Jonestown uh, being silenced. Uh, my gut instinct is, again, that the issue uh, evolves around the 400 years of mistreatment that we've experienced as Black Americans. And the fact that we're only considered three-fifths human, we're treated like that, we see, we're seeing this on a day-to-day -day basis. And the fact that we, our voices didn't matter, our stories didn't matter, no one was interested in it because they didn't feel it was compelling enough to draw the attention of the general public. and. For me, what was so hurtful is when I saw our black media personalities not even give us an opportunity to discuss what we had gone through over the years as uh, members of People's Temple and then the experiences that both Leslie and I encountered and endured while we were in Guyana, just uh, unspeakable events. Can y'all both uh, give me, um, um, Mr. Herbert, who was here the first time, can y'all both give me an idea of, uh, y'all were young people, but from a young person's perspective, what was life like uh, socially and politically when you think about the, uh, you know, mid-1970s or so? Of course, we have the, the, the uh, turbulent 60s. At this point by 1978, uh, the, the Black Panthers have really had really fallen apart. Where were things politically and socially where it felt like, you know, Jim Jones may have been able to take advantage and saying, I'm the person who could save you? We'll start with you, Miss Yolanda. Well, you know, for my memory, it was the time of Hippie Hill, the Black Panthers, Hare Krishnas, all these types of movements. And everyone was looking for a better life. And ultimately, for me, I had felt the loss of Dr. Martin Luther King because I recall as a child marching with them when he came to San Francisco and hearing him speak. And the fact that we had no leader, it was almost like we were a lost tribe of people. And as a young person, I was looking for something to, to become a part of that could change society's beliefs. And I truly believed that we could one day all live together in peace and harmony. 
And I think that was really the message during that time. It was more about taking care of each other, doing for your fellow mm -hmm. man that you would want them to do for you. Ms. Leslie? So me growing up in the same era as Yolanda, um, I participated in peace, marks, you know, peace marches during the Vietnam War. I was probably you know, 11 and 12. And so there was um, an interest and a compassion for, you know, I hated the Vietnam War, of course, not the soldiers, but the cause of it. Um, but people simple for me, um, you know, it's, it's hard because we were brought in as children. Um, I think I shared before, I had no idea that people suffered. I came from an upper middle class family. Once I learned in People's Temple that people went to bed hungry, that children were suffering, that there was discrimination um, that was felt, I, it felt good to me. It felt like I could make a difference even at a young age. And so being, I, and I was in the nucleus, you know, of People's Temple in Reverend Valley. So I saw Jim Jones as, yes, a savior that he could bring people together of all backgrounds, of all, you know, anyone and everyone. People's Temple encompassed probably a piece of everybody from the world and that we could do good, that we could make a difference, that we could become a socialist organization and then also just be this incredible example to the world that all people can live together in harmony with this great love for each other and great love for humanity. And that was, that was the appeal for me at 13. And I wanna remind people, like you all said last time, and I didn't know this, that he was paying a People's Temple, Jim Jones, they were paying the illegal fees for people that were caught up in the criminal justice system, uh, helping elderly people. So it was almost like a, uh, a uh, grooming, if, if you will. All right, I, I wanna ask you this, and I'm asking this respectfully. I think about my uh, grandfather, and I remember, may he rest in peace, he always had a white Jesus in his, in his home, <laughs> right? Well, That's just what he had. Yes. My grandfather right. had Dr. King, JFK, and a white yes. Jesus. So I wanted to ask y'all, and I'm thinking about, there were a lot of older people who were at People's Temple, the generations way before y'all. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Jim Jones could have done this? Had all these people go to Guyana, sell their property, give up their belongings and everything if he were black? No. No. I do absolutely not. Absolutely not. I do not. I do go, not. Go ahead, Ms. Leslie. And, and so I, that's what we talked about. Had it been a black man, no, we wouldn't have gone because we have been indoctrinated. My grandparents, too, had the Last Supper with Jesus, you know, with the Last Supper with the white Jesus. The church did, too, back then, a Baptist church. So, no, I don't believe that Black folks would have followed this man um, had he been, you know, Black. And that's that, you know, Jesus, you know, that white Jesus saviorship. And that's what we, that's what generations have been raised with. So no, I don't think it would have been possible. But remember also those senior citizens, a lot of them were religious. What compelled them, not only were their care for them, you know, they were, they were, they had tremendous care. We took care of them but also the fact that Jim was faking the healings. And that's yes. the majority of the reason Black, Healthcare. I believe, right, senior citizens came to People's Temple and just said, you know, I know he's throwing the Bible on the ground. I know he's talking about Jesus, is that he's the Jesus, but they compromised that because they thought that they were going to be healed. And in my opinion, many of us were brainwashed into the belief that, of course, yes, Jesus was more of a white skin tone, then of course we recognize today that Jesus is black. He's a black man. But the thing is, is that the government, there is no way that this government would have allowed a black man to rise to the level that Jim Jones mm. was able to do mm. in that time frame. nor would they have allowed him to move thousand, almost a thousand people and continue to have all of these checks being processed through People's Temple for these United States citizens that were no longer in the country. They would have also gotten in trouble, not only for human trafficking, but what about the children that were actually foster children right. that were taken from out of the United States mm -hmm. without any notification of their biological family members? So I say absolutely no way 
would this have happened if it if Jim Jones would have been black? Um, so I want to ask you all this. I was doing more research. And one of the things that I was blown away to hear, and I don't know if um, you could speak to this as far as your late husband, Miss Leslie, that Jim Jones would make all of the men, this is a bit graphic, when they would use the bathroom, they all had to sit down, even if they were urinating, because he wanted them to know that he is the ultimate man. I was really floored when I, I read this, and I'm just thinking about, again, I, I want to be careful here. I'm just thinking about all the black men I know in my life that they would <laughs> never do that. Uh, Miss Leslie, did you did you hear about this, that the men were forced to sit? And if they didn't, they would be punished publicly. They would be beaten if they didn't sit down even when they were urinating. Can you speak to this, Miss Leslie? Yes, because um, when I got when I got to Jonestown, it was still separate bathrooms, still separate outhouses. Um, and about six months later, women and men were sharing the bathrooms together. The men would sit down. I never saw a man stand up. Um, so Jim was trying to really demasculate them because he was so insecure in himself. Um, and then, of course, that's part of when you think about it, how racist is that? How, how racist is that? To try to to try to humiliate them, um, I didn't know if it was mandatory, but I know that's what I witnessed: is that the men were always sitting down. If we had to use a bathroom together in a unisex, you know, co-ed outhouse, the men would sit down. It would not be surprising to me if that was true. And it wouldn't surprise me because uh, Jim Jones frequently talked about the size of his uh, gen groin areas, his genitals, and everything, and he would always feel threatened by at the thought of another man uh, having a larger um, organ than he. And so that was his insecurity and his method of humiliating everyone. And specifically, he focused on humiliating Black men. Well, and also, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. But also, Jim, never Jim did not take a Black a, a woman as a Black lover. Right. Never I would he that. do yeah. that. Right. He did not except like black when, people. Shonda. Except for when he except for when he raped Shonda, who was 19. Shonda. But no, he yes. he not ever had black women as lovers for that That's very right. reason, his insecurity. Yes. Jim Jones raped a black woman. I've never heard this before. He raped a black oh, woman. Yeah. Shonda, Shonda James. Yeah, she was um she was 19, and this was this was one of the one reasons. This is the straw that broke the camel back for me. Um, and this was um a young girl who was 19. And when I saw her, she was, she looked like a rabbit animal, um, hair all over head in a hospital gown. And she was by the radio room. And I asked my friend what happened. And he, and she said, Jim got her. And so she had to be brought to Jim Jones. And then she was put into the, um, the special care unit, which was a unit that if anyone was, um, you know, a threat or talking back or, or, or just, um, not, you know, part of the community in a positive way, they would be drugged and put in this special care unit. And Shonda was. So you don't hear, no one talks about it. No one talks about that. it. Because yeah, she was then, actually, Yolanda, wasn't she a girlfriend of one of the, wasn't Shonda? She was a girlfriend at one point of one of Jones's sons. sons. And then she also, at the time, was married to uh, one of the Oliver boys, there were two Ol Olivers, Bruce Oliver and Billy Oliver. Mm -hmm. And when their mother heard of this, that is when I decided I was so outraged that I would tell her everything I knew. She went over there to Jonestown. And when she came back with the concerned family members, she came back with none of her loved ones. But she also uh, shared with me how Shonda was being mistreated unavailable and just totally out of it. She had been drugged to the point that she was out of um, control. She, she couldn't care for herself. And this is just outrageous. And to think that uh, Congressman Ryan was there and he probably never even saw this young lady or was able to determine the extent of the brutality that was going on in Jonestown. For those that don't know that Congress, Congressman Ryan is the uh, 
con congressman who was uh, shot and killed when he went to Jonestown to report on it. And as he was leaving, he's shot and killed on the um, on the uh, tarmac. Uh, really. So, Miss Leslie, just one quick question. Uh, your husband, who you lost to Jonestown, did he ever say anything to you? Like, wow, like, did, did he know he was being humiliated? Did he know he was being exploited? Did he know he was being treated? I know you said he was a part of a security team, correct? Right. He was also one of the assassins. Hmm. So he was completely indoctrinated. Was, Joe was completely indoctrinated. Um, there was a time when he pulled a gun on me um, and put it to my head and said, you know, this is basically the best place. I, I questioned him and said, what, what would happen if Jim died? And this is towards the end. And he said there would be bloodshed. And we would just go to New Jersey, where he was from, and live with his parents and take our son, Jakari. But by that time, he was totally, he was lost. He was gone. I mean, if had he caught me that day, he would have he would have killed me that morning, November 18th. That's how that's how brainwashed he was. Um, I want to play a clip of uh, this is the uh, third clip, Stephanie. This is of the uh, final day. Um, this is the, I shouldn't say the final day. This is that day where the massacre happened. And I want to get y'all reaction to this. And I wasn't able to get reactions when I played clips before, but people wanted me to ask you what y'all thought. Uh, this is of people, um, and I know this is triggering, uh, saying that this is, this is time to give our life. They're agreeing with uh, Jim Jones. If we can play this third clip. And I I'm looking at so many people crying. I wish you would not cry. And just think, Father, just think him. I'm happy to hear the Father. But don't do this. Free at last. See, keep your emotions down. Keep your emotions down. Children, it will not hurt if you be if you be quiet. If okay, be stop quiet. playing. Stop playing. Stop playing. Stop playing. It's okay. I'm sorry, but I, I, uh, that's no. It's okay. They need to hear this. When I heard what I assumed was an elderly woman, um. Saying that, I just uh. What, what are your thoughts when you hear that, Miss Leslie? There were people in San Francisco who did not have a life. They were poor, they were hungry, they felt unloved and unsafe. People's Temple offered some type of safety and a, and a lot of love in, in many ways. Um, and there's people that, of course, gave up everything. What would they have to go back to? The humiliation of their families telling them that they made a mistake. Um, I think what what rocks me the most is, I'm sorry, is that we were also so tired because we worked six days a week, you know, 12 hour days. We weren't fed correctly. We were emotionally, mentally, and physically abused. And so I was tired and I was, and I'm, I was young, but I was exhausted by, by just the, the constant barrage of Jim and the, the, the paranoia that we lived through. So it hurts me. What hurts me the most is that when I heard that child, um, that could have been my niece or nephew because there was a witness that said my sister fought like hell. And I know she did. And so, but also, you know, for my mother to witness the deaths of her children and her grandchildren, it still, you know, breaks my heart. But people were tired and there were people that thought that Jonestown was the best place for them. There were people that actually thought that. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's painful still because, you know, every time I see the photos of the dead bodies, I'm searching for my family. Still, I'm searching for my mother in that beige jumpsuit that I gave her to wear on the last day. But 
again, the people of, P of Jonestown were exhausted. They were, the, the brainwashing continued. Jim prepared us from death for death since I was 15, you know? And so they were, they thought that they were doing, that they wanted to die because there was nothing left for them. And, and, and so I, I don't speak for everyone. I can't, but obviously she said that Jonestown was the best place. That's the best thing that ever happened to her. There's a lot of people that believe that. A lot of people that believe that. Ms. Yolanda. Yes. Um, my thoughts are that first and foremost, they were, many of them were forced to go over to Jonestown in the end. And they had no contact with their families directly. There was no phone communication there with your family. And again, all of the mail incoming and outgoing was read prior to uh, its destinations. The other thing is, is that for someone to thank father, that just breaks my heart. Cause I remember how many times we had to thank father for things that were absolutely foolish that we were thanking him for. We would get beaten and we'd thank father for the beating. And then to hear him say, please, please, we're going to be free at last. I'm certain that some of those people di didn't see this as an act of freedom. And again, I say Black people are not the first ones to stand up and voluntarily say, I'm ready to commit suicide. And especially when you realize that these people are not waking back up, as Leslie alluded to, when we were even in San Francisco, there were these, these types of loyalty tests. And so again, I think in terms of many who first started to drink this potion, did not realize that it was really going to be their last and final days. And that is why there are so many bodies that were reported to have been injected and you could see bruises on the bodies and whatnot. I truly believe that there were some members who fought to sustain their lives. I think there were many members that fought. Um, and, and what I will say was there was only set, this was a crime scene. They yes. treated, they treated yes. it as a suicide, 918 people laying in the dirt, yes. rotting in the Guyanese jungle. There yes. was only seven autopsy, autopsy, I'm sorry, autopsies performed one on Jim Jones and the rest on a couple, a few other people, were they, were um, Dr. Matu, who was the, who was a forensics uh, person in, in Guyana at the time, saw injection marks on the shoulders. So I still, the majority of the people I still believe were murdered mm -hmm. and they did not willingly lay down their lives, but they gave the poison to the children first. So had I been there, if I saw my baby if, grab Jakari and, and poison my Jakari, First of all, I would have fought like hell, but I would be dead too. They killed the children yes. first. Yes. Hmm. I cannot believe you just told me there were only seven autopsies out of over 900 people. That's right. That is, and I'm going to say this again. I think if it was 900 white folks who were killed, they would have did a <laughs> lot more than seven autopsies. You're correct. That is. It, yeah. They would have sent uh, doctors and forensic people from the United States into that country to process that crime scene and the bodies would not have been just put together all together in one grave site. They would have given those US citizens, if they were white, more dignity in death than what happened with our loved ones and friends and extended families. You would have had Jimmy Carter down there. I mean, exactly. it would have been, there's, there's no way, there's no way. There's no way. Um, I want to head to a break, but I do want to ask you all this before we go to a break. Um, again, this is about giving compassion and I, you know, talking about the people who lost their lives. But I am curious to know, I'll start with you, Miss Yolanda, because again, your story is so powerful. Um, and you, you, you worked outside of Jonestown and you were leaking information to the press and you told me before you, you, you had a letter that you gave to, um, I believe, Jim Jones' son to, uh, to, to, to give to your mother. You, you fought your way out, but this is for both of y'all. I do want to know uh, the fear. There's fear of corporal punishment. 
Uh, there's a community who believes you cannot escape. There was this idea that Russia and everybody's going to come in and get us and massacre all of us. What made y'all move past that fear and say, I must, I must get out of here because sadly, a majority of folks couldn't get out of there. Yolanda, what made you move past that fear, put your life on the line, sending a letter to give a letter to Jim Jones' son to get to your mother? Your mother comes there and re rescues you. But what made you move past that fear and say, I have to get out? Because in my deepest subconscious thoughts, I felt that I was going to die over there. Something just came over me that this was going to be a final death sentence. Uh, for me, Jonestown and uh, was like a slave plantation. And I recalled it, things that my parents had told me that, that was shared by their parents about what it was like to live on a plantation. And when I saw, witnessed and recognized how we were being treated, and I should say mistreated, I recognized at that point that I had to do everything within my might to try and save my baby and myself. Miss mm. Leslie? Um, I think I mentioned once I realized that racism actually existed, and I, and I recognized that, um, working in the medical field, you know, just seeing the, 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 the contradictions that this is not a equal society or community. Um, and then of course, Shonda was the straw that broke the camel back. And I felt, so what, what moved past the fear was, I didn't know I had any faith left. I was raised, you know, basically sometimes, you know, in a Baptist church with my grandparents. Um, I never thought that Jim was actually God. Um, but I remember praying one night and saying, God, please let this be the last year that I'm here. Because it was, I knew that my son had no future. There was no talk about college or anything outside of Jonestown. There was no future. And I said, I have to get my son out. And, and of course, death was the option because I knew had I been caught, I would have been killed. Uh, and we were, I was prepared to die. But it was really not knowing that I even had faith. And so when those, when Diane and, and came to me and said, we have a way out, that was God intervening and me being able to listen to the Holy Spirit to say, it's time to move. And so that, was I still scared? Of course, I was, I was, I was frightened beyond, beyond my, my mind, but um, I listened, I listened, I heard, and I moved. You were prepared to die to live. That is- Exactly. Uh, that is really powerful. One of the things that I heard during the Trump administration is that Trump is a Jim Jones. Trump is a Jim Jones. Uh, I would love to know, is that analogy going too far? Is it accurate? Uh, do you see that as somebody who knew Jim Jones? Ms. Yolanda, let's start with you. Right on point. Ex exactly what I have been stating since he became the commander in chief, because he does and had a strict hierarchy he was very opinionated. And if you disagreed with him, he would take you on and challenge you. He's an impulsive liar, just like Jim Jones. And he's a control freak, just like Jim Jones. And uh, in fact, his tr characteristics were so similar to Jim Jones he frightened me, and I would say if there was any possibility for Jim Jones having uh, been alive, he would have been right inside. His spirit was right inside of Donald Trump. Miss hmm. mm -hmm. Leslie, um, the parallels are are there. Uh, Yolanda is correct. He he emulated um, how Jim Jones was, and we you know there is a, a term, the Trump uh, cult. Um, and, but he's a personality cult. Um, but as he said, he could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and his, and his followers, his supporters would still support him. And that's exactly what ended up happening. We see, you know, the resurrection that, I mean, the resurrection that happened, but he was, he's egotistical. Um, he's a narcissist. He's a sociopath and all the makings of Jim Jones. And I, imagined that what if Jim Jones, what if there was social media 
in the time of People's Temple. Mm. How much more damage could he have done? Wow. Think about it, right? But wow. yes, Trump's followers will follow him. They still do, even though he's not president. And I think, you know, someone asked if it was, if, if Jim Jones ordered us to storm the Capitol, would the majority of people done it? Yes, yes. they would have. That's how dedicated and loyal they were to Jim Jones, the same as Trump supporters. So it's very real and it's very, and, and they're very, very similar. So when you would see some of Trump's rants on television and on social media, would it give you a chill? Would it trigger you to, to what you saw from, from uh, Jim Jones? It definitely did for me. Um, I was very troubled by his uh, presidency and I was really frightened of what he was going to really do. And had he gotten a second term of office, I just knew at that time and I was actually even looking into other countries that I could free, for, go to to live because I knew there was no way I could stay in the United States and tolerate another four years of Trump. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Leslie, was it triggering? It was, yes, it was triggering. Um, I was, the, the night he was elected, I, I, I took off work for three days. I couldn't, I could barely move. I was so shocked that our society voted for this racist, right? And what, fe what, what, what Jim Jones was so similar because again, the majority of people were black and he was taking advantage of them. I felt that we were going back 50 years with, with Trump. And so, yes, it triggered me. I mean, I, I like Yolanda, I was looking, per I mean, seriously looking at other countries to look. look. If he had been reelected, I would not be here. I, I couldn't stay. Do but you then part of me said you're supposed to stay because we still have work to do. But mentally, you know, and emotionally, I was drained the entire four years. Just to seriously just drained. And do you remember when he made the statement that he had done more for Black people than, than anyone? Any and when he said that, I said, mm. Jim Jones, that's what he said to us. And exactly. that in and of itself made me cringe so much that I even shared with my mother, God rest her soul, she was alive. And I told her, I said, mom, I don't know if we're gonna be able to stay here. This is not gonna work out for us. Mm -hmm. uh, I want, I'm, a few people sent some questions. They wanted to know, what was the percentage or the amount of uh, white men who were in, who were in Guyana? Was it a small percentage? Uh, were there a lot of white, white, white men there or no? No, there were not a lot of white men. The Yolanda, correct me if, I'm, if, right. I'm, if my memory doesn't serve me, but on the original crew that was sent to Jonestown to clear the, the, the jungle, they were, they were all white. Is that your recollection, Yolanda? That is correct, indeed. Right. So 69% of the occupants were, were African-American and Black American. Very few white men. That's really really fascinating to me. That's really yeah. fascinating. Um, people wanted me to also ask, how is your son, Jakari? I mean, I'm sure he doesn't remember Miss Leslie, but how, how did you explain this to him as he got older and with his father not being here and his grandmother? How, how did you have that conversation with your son? I had that conversation with Jakari when he was probably around uh, 10 or 11. Um, and so Jakari is not doing well. He is in prison where he has spent the majority of his life. Um, my child was raised um, in the womb with violence. Um, in People's Temple, he suffered the violence, you know, and, and not just, not physical, but the, but the environment itself. And in Jonestown, our babies were pulled up in the middle of the night and rushed to the kitchen with the tables turned over under and, and them yelling, we're under attack, we're under attack. Jakari has not ever done well. He's had an obsession with guns. Um, I'm hoping, I'm praying that he will come home soon, um, but he has not done well. There are a couple other young men that had relatives in Jonestown or had some affiliation that are doing major, major time. So Jakari was not, Jakari did not fare well after this. He just didn't, and he just didn't. Mm. And you also said when you came back from Jonestown again, y'all can watch part two when you escaped to the jungle with other people. And your father uh, said to you, um, 
why didn't you get uh, your brother who was 16? Mm -hmm. And and you said when you heard that at that moment, you felt like you lost your father uh, for it appeared that he was trying to blame you. Uh, did you and your father ever reconcile before he passed away? My dad tried. He really tried um, to um, love me in the way that he could. But I was his step. I mean, I was his adopted daughter. My brother was his blood son and his only son. So we tried to reconcile, um, but it wasn't. It didn't work. The last postcard I have um, was he was saying, "I'm on the way to spend all my money on the way to Europe." sorry kid so no we didn't we couldn't and the fact that you know my dad was a racist i'm gonna i'm i'm saying that my dad loved my mother she happened to be black um but my mother when my when my dad met joe he was just no there's no way you're with this you're with this black man um but god rest his soul um he suffered because of my brother's death um he suffered and and he died he died suffering we were estranged at the time of his death so I, I tell people just because you're in a interracial relationship does not mean you can't be a racist. So that's really powerful. Yeah. I think about right now, you know, you think about it. And although I'm not saying this is exactly the same, but we think about black men being shot and killed by police, um, grief and trauma. And we wonder how black mothers are and fathers are navigating these spaces. Uh, you experience so much trauma. Uh, how did you get through it? And what can you say to people who uh, are just deeply wounded? And it's, and I've interviewed mothers who lost their children by police and there's a wound there. And do you have any, any insight on how you get through such extreme grief? For me, um, basically, you know, I turned to drugs first and alcohol first. I did not seek psychological help, you know, which I should have someone should have taken my hand and said, you need to decompress this. But, you know, the black, you know, black folks and that my grandparents were old, they didn't know any better to say, you need to take, you need some time, some downtime. Um, I moved and I moved in pain for 20 years before I actually came out to people and said, I'm a survivor, did an interview when people would, I would be at work and someone would say, oh, what about those crazy people in Jonestown at a, you know, in a conference room? And I would just say, well, why do you think they were crazy? I never admitted to anyone for years. I changed my name that I was a part of People's Temple in Jonestown. So that in itself, by staying silent, did not help me to get through this. The first step in my healing was to forgive Jim Jones. That was the very first step because once I could forgive him, I could forgive myself for surviving. It took many years, but it also just took a decision because spiritually, I knew I needed to be reconnected. It was, it, was, it was eating me inside. My soul was crying out to say, you've got to reconnect with God. You, you have to reconnect. And so I made moves to do that. Um, and I moved to Georgia. I got a divorce. I sat in my room. I wrote. I had no associations. I told people I'm going underground. And I did the work. You know, I cried, I prayed, because when I say that I did not want to be here, I did not want to live. But I didn't believe in suicide, so I didn't kill myself. I made one attempt, and I just couldn't pull the trigger. So for years, I suffered, and I suffered in silence because there was no one to talk to. Finally, when I made that decision to, I needed to be, I needed to reconnect with, with God. I needed to reconnect with my spirituality. And when I did that, my entire life changed. I made a decision and still, I'm still a work in progress. It goes on. Yolanda talked about triggers. I had a Dr. Pepper at work one day and I, I, I freaked out because that's what we drank was Dr. Peppers. I still take two minute showers, right? Um, I couldn't eat rice for 20 years. Finally, I can eat rice. But it was a decision that I needed to move forward and I needed to be better. And that I did not survive this, just not to talk about it, not to testify that the power of God is real, that prayer is real, um, but it's still, a I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it. But again, forgiving Jim Jones was the first step for me to heal. That was the first step. And survivor's and guilt is real as Leslie has uh, shared. And it's funny you mentioned the rice because I can't eat, eat like rice pudding. And there's so many things that we 
couldn't consume over there that suddenly we see here. And it's like, I find myself hoarding some things just because I can have it. <laughs> do, do, yeah. do you both uh, identify with the religion at all? Yes, I do. I'm yes. Christian. And, Christian. And I'm, I'm, I'm Christian in a, in, in, and so I'm, I, I study, but I also believe that God loves everyone. So I'm not fanatical. I don't try to convert people, but I love God. You know, I, I believe that Jesus was, is everything as far as being an example to that. I try to live my life with no conflict, with love, with compassion. Um, so I really don't like titles, but if I have to give one, that would be it. I consider myself, you know, a, a, a person that loves God and tries to emulate that in my daily life. But I, but again, not the dogma of religion, yes. because yes. I believe God loves everyone and love equals God and God equals love. That's, 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 that's me. And so it's been 42 years, almost 43 years since I lost, you know, my baby brother, Mark, um, who was 16. And so your trauma is real. Your pain is real. There is no formula to grieve. Um, I will say that it will get easier, but they will never be forgotten. Um, you have to, I mean, whatever works for you to get through your grief, you do that. Um, if it means staying in bed all day or crying, it's just your way of, of handling your loss. Uh, and all I can say is just to remember their love and not their death. Well said. Let's go to a call here. Let's go to Wendy from Maryland, first time caller. Yes. Wendy, good hey, afternoon. Wendy. Afternoon. Hi. I, I want to thank you for having the guest that you have with um, Leslie Wagner Wilson and, and Yolanda Williams and the sensitivity that you're bringing out. I want to remind um, your listeners uh, in, in speaking to the blackness that was suffered in this massacre, uh, the slang that is associated with the Jonestown massacre, we're all aware of. How many times have you sat and heard oh, don't drink the Kool-Aid or you're on your job or, and they might say, we got to get everybody to drink the Kool-Aid. They have reduced the loss of predominantly black life. They've reduced it to a colloquial term. I'm very mindful when people use that term to make the correction and educate them that there were 918 lives that were lost that day. And the way this country has dismissed and continues to dismiss black life or death, that we can no longer feed into that saying. We can't use that saying anymore because it is to feed into the black lives don't matter. Hmm. And that's my comment. And also folks should know that it wasn't Kool-Aid, it was Flavor-Aid. A lot of people don't, right. don't realize that. Can y'all speak to that? That is true. It, it's become pop culture. It's become a reference. You see it in movies. You see it on, uh, you see it cable, cable news, pundits say it. Uh, when you hear that, uh, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts? Miss Yolanda, we'll start with you. Well, first of all, I think that it's, ex it's extremely insensitive and insulting. Um, in my line of work, I've had police officers even make that type of comment. And I immediately challenge them and correct them on it. Because just as the caller has stated, it shows the blatant insensitivity and the anti-Blackness that is accepted by this society. And it's extremely unfortunate that we have not developed a sense of morality that would tell us that that is not an appropriate comment to make in any venue. Ms. Leslie? Well, of course I agree. It's painful to hear. Uh, I don't know how many people actually um, know what it is. There was a, I don't know if it was a documentary, but I did, did see a something revealed on screen and they were going around the street asking people, do you know what drink the Kool-Aid means? And they're like, don't drink the Kool-Aid. And they were like, no. Um, did you know what, you know, and people didn't know what it was. 
But what hurts me is that it's still being used. And you're right. It's in films. It's on TV. It's in uh, movies. Um, they, it's an insensitivity towards us. Those that know and still use it, because, you know, people just copy terms and all the time, but it's offensive. It's very offensive. And I've sat in rooms and I've heard them use that. And I'd say, do you know what that means? And, and please don't use that. That's, that's, that's referring to 918 people that have died that happened the majority to be black. Yeah, in, in an era where we are so concerned about language, which I think we should be, I think language is, is important. Mm -hmm. uh, I would think that we, especially in black communities, uh, we could chuck ourselves before saying that. Again, majority black women and children. Say another question that I had and uh, that I, I got a lot after uh, the show on April 1st, and we spoke to it a little bit, but uh, some people just wanted just to have you all expound on it a bit more. I'm gonna play a clip. But it's about, you know, we all know that Jim Jones had women that he was with, but the fact that he was um, sleeping with men who were a part of the People's Temple. And uh, let, let's give some context because I, I couldn't find somebody who had that experience, but I want to play a clip of people talking about Jim Jones openly sleeping with men. And yeah, it's just very interesting. Listen to this. And I remember one night, um, one of the brothers had stood up and said, you know, I think everybody that wants father to screw him in the butt, you need to take a enema first. I'm telling you the truth, man. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. And then the question went on, well, how many of you in here have had him to do that? And it, whether they were lying or just following suit, hands of the men just went up around the room. And I'm sitting there petrified because I'm like, is this what it's leading to that I'm supposed to get to? And I'm thinking, hmm. But I played it off like, okay, I'm being cool. Okay, if that's where they at, that's not where I'm at. Saw a young person that he found attractive, be they male or female, he would come on to them. How could you say no to Jim Jones? The only thing I can do is to be an aggressive heterosexual with a man or woman. I don't care whatever you want to be. You be the woman. I would do that for socialism. He didn't like it, he said. He really didn't enjoy it, but he was forced to do this for the cause. I had been in the temple for just a few months. I was sent backstage in Los Angeles to, to get something for somebody. I don't remember what. And Jones happened to be coming out of his room. And he said, hi, Tim, how are you doing? How's it going? How do you like everything so far? And oh. I like it a lot and, you know, it's really cool. I don't remember exactly. And he reached up and kind of patted the back of my neck and he said, I'll you in the ass if you want. And I just kind of stammered, uh, no, you know, I, no. And he said, well, you know, if, if you ever want that, that's, that's okay. You know, you just let me know and we'll do that. So, uh, and again, this is nothing about uh, homophobia. I am a gay man, nothing about that whatsoever. We're talking about sexual exploitation and cults. Just want to make that really, really clear. But I got to tell you, this is a part that really confuses me. It deeply confuses me that heterosexual men would sleep. I, I, I can't, I'm not even sure what the question is. It's, it really puts me in a ball of confusion. How how does manipulating and brainwashing go that far? What do y'all say to that? And did you know people in people's temple and men in people's temple that were sleeping with Jim Jones and they felt like they were with father? I don't. Well, uh, go, go ahead, Yolanda. Go, go ahead, Yolanda, please. Sorry. Well, as a church counselor, um, unfortunately, I had heard of these types of incidents and Jim Jones rationalized it by stating that the man or the woman needed it. And it was so that they would stay in the church because they had so many um, resources and they were viable and vital to the continuance of people's temple. And so he was making sacrifices and this is the way he portrayed this. And again, 
at the time when I was in People's Temple, I still was a young woman growing up there. So nothing really surprised me as to what he types of sex he engaged in and with whom. Uh, but in my deepest um, sense of what is acceptable and not acceptable, it wasn't something that I would, of course, participate in or anything. And I just felt like those people were just weak minded individuals. But Jim Jones consistently bragged about his ability in that particular um, area. And that once he was with you, he knew that you would always stay committed to people's temple and, and loyal to him. <laughs> Miss, Miss Leslie. So my first indoctrination in the gym having sex in the, in, in, in with men and women was I was probably 14. He mentioned it from the pulpit in Reverend Valley. I'd never even heard about that. Um, but part of that was manipulation, but he also kept telling the membership that all men had homosexual tendencies. They were all homosexual. So it, I didn't know anybody personally. I will say when I was working in the office with Larry Shack, I think eventually they became lovers only because of his demeanor changed, but this is part of, as Yolanda said, he would just tout that, you know, he had to sleep with men and women because he was saving them. And I always thought, well, why do they need to be saving? If they want to leave, let them leave. That was always my thought. Um, so it was well known. It was well documented. Everybody taught, I mean, it was a conversation and it, then it became normal. It, it was normal that he would say he slept with men and he slept with women. Um, that's, but do I know anybody personally besides Larry Shack? No, I, I, I didn't, I don't, and, I didn't. And the person you, you mentioned, uh, Larry Shack, is that his name? I'm saying it mm -hmm. right? He's, uh, yes. he, didn't he, um, he, he took the, uh, he pleaded the fifth because he didn't want to testify, correct? Oh no, Larry, you're, you're no. referring to Larry Layton. So Larry oh, Shack I'm is sorry. the doctor. That's okay, Larry Shack uh, was the doctor at Jonestown. I see. He was the doctor at Jonestown. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's important for these cults that we realize this isn't about gay or straight. It's about sexual exploitation. Exactly. And that's 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 yes. a huge point. And I know. Uh, yeah, it's a it's huge. And um, yeah, let's go to a call here. Let's go to uh, Linda from Virginia. Linda, how are you? Hi. Hi, Clay. I am listening to this and I, it just reminds me of the stories that my in-laws and my husband talk about my husband was 13 when he left out of there um in the in in the night with his parents who are also from georgetown um guiana so um it's just really hard alarming that this is all coming out because my father-in-law spoke on how the men would be terrified of being selected or targeted by jim jones wanting to have sex with them. He was just a sadist, a hedonist. He was just, like you said, sexual exploitation where some men may have had hidden, um, you know, homosexual tendencies and, and they enjoyed it because, you know, those were the men that would talk amongst each other about what was happening and kind of clicked off to themselves. And then you had the other men who were so deeply entrenched and by that time indoctrinated mentally um, and physically into that Jim Jones um, cult that they felt they didn't have any other way out other than to comply or to be killed. You know, they everybody was so terrified of this man. And I, and I just want to thank you and thank the brave people that lived to talk about this and live to warn people just about cults in general, how dangerous they are and how innocent they all start out under the guise of religion, that people are so, you know, so down and so desperate for some type of salvation that you get sucked into stuff like this, that you leave a country that you, bo you were born in to go over to another country following an individual claiming that he is the chosen one or that he is, you know, representing a godlike deity or a godlike figure. And, 
it's just very, very uh, alarming. Um, it's all. It just reminds me of no different than something that's. Um, I'm going to just tie a political uh, uh, aspect to it with Trump and the people that are following Trump. It's very um, uh, possible that Trump can, you know, translate into his his followership into something of so something so insidious. Yes. So I just wanted to thank you for that, and I appreciate you letting me have this call. So thank uh, you. I, God bless you and your guests. Thank you. God bless you too. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Linda. Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, I've had friends who've told me uh, there's no way I, I could I, I would get into a cult. There's no way I could be brainwashed. There's no way that'll happen to me. Uh, can this happen to anybody? And I know again, y'all were children when you first got involved and you were there up until your up until your your early twenties. But can this happen to anyone? Or is there a a certain kind of person this happens to? A certain kind of personality? Let's start with you, Miss Leslie, because because your your mother introduced you know y- y'all brought in the church via your mother. So, what do you think? Anyone, or is it a certain kind of person? I I believe it's anyone. It depends on where you're you know where you're at um, in your life at that time. People's Temple provided a lot of services. You know that was a question I had. People would ask me how do, how do people join and how do they stay. I couldn't think of anything except for when I was in a relationship way too soon coming back from South America and my ex-husband was very abusive and he would, you know, hit me and I go to work and I come back and he'd say, I'm sorry. And then we'd make up and then, um, you know, it would, it would keep happening. It wasn't until I left that I thought every time he hit me and he'd apologize and then he'd love on me and then I'd say, everything's going to going to be better and you know it must be me people the members of people temple were an abusive relationship because once jim scolded you you still wanted his approval you needed him to say you're such a good socialist you're 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 a good person so it was a violent a domestic violent mentally uh a, a violent group i mean that's what we were we were we were traumatized but hoping that we could eventually live up to what, how he wanted us to be. That's the only thing I could relate to, because again, you said we were children. We were children. Yes. That relationship, my relationship was an abusive relationship. And I just, and I started again thinking, well, it, it must be me because maybe I'm not doing something right. That was people's temple. What are your thoughts, Yolanda? How somebody get involved in, a cult? Actually, anyone can get involved in a cult because we know the word cult comes from culture. And by definition, a cult is a group movement held together by a shared commitment of a charismatic leader or ideology. So it has its own belief system. And it's something where you find it being the answer to all of life's questions. And it offers you a special solution but at the same time, it, you have to be completely loyal. You're finally part of something that's a tight-knit, close family or group of friends. And you just suddenly find yourself feeling uncomfortable when you're away from the group. And it's like your minds have are so entwined with each other that you become like just a, a, a unit, one body, just moving along. It's subliminal. It, it can happen in a church. And like you look at the nation of Islam, look at the church of Scientology, the Father Divine Movement, Jehovah Witnesses, Branch Davidians, the Manson family, the Ku Klux Klan, gangs, police department, police agencies, the thin blue line, all of that. They are cults if you really look at the definition of a cult. So on this day, April 15th, 1980, a mini series was aired. It was called Guyana Tragedy, the story of Jim Jones. It was also called The Messiah. It aired on this day in 1980. I'm curious to know, what did y'all think when less than two years after this mass murder, a mini series comes out on it? What were your thoughts? We'll start with you, Miss Leslie. 
you're t- you know, it's 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 taking advantage of it's trying to make a dollar because there were not enough facts to even create a movie. Is that the movie with with um, Booth in it? Was yes, it? exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Powers Booth. Um, yeah. And so, of course, it did not represent us as black people, right? And James um, Earl Jones. James Earl Jones, by the way. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so, no, I thought it was disgusting. Um, books came out the the next week about what happened. So it was it was a way for them to 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 capitalize on our death on our tragedy. I watched it once. I thought, you know, it was okay, but it still was not. Uh, it still was not representing what ever actually happened. And again, after two years, there still weren't enough facts out to make it accurate. You know, movie. Mm. Yolanda, what did you think when it comes out on this day, nineteen eighty? Well, I thought it was definitely since since. Since I saw it, (laughs) it was just overreaching. Mm. And there were so many things that were sensationalized. And then there were truths that were not made evident in that movie. And so really, I'm happy that it's not something that's consistently shown. And, And I just think that It just made uh, the members of People's Temple appear to be just totally foolish. And I mean, it it just wasn't real. It it was just the disgusting, cheaply made for TV movie. Yeah, I mean, I I can't imagine. It seems deeply insensitive. It seems deeply insensitive less than two years later. Uh, We're going to head to a break, but I am curious to know if, if someone came along, maybe if it was a black director, a black woman director that wanted to make a proper movie, you know, a proper series on what happened, would y'all be open to that? Or do you feel like, no, let this, let this go. Don't turn this into a feature film. What, what do y'all think of that? Because you never know. Netflix, Hulu, they, they, they make movies about everything. I think that it would be a fantastic thing if we could have a actual movie that showed the the truth and actually from the black perspective so that it, Leslie and I and people who are still survivors we wouldn't have to have so experience so much of the survivor's guilt but in fact it would actually make us more victorious especially if we were allowed to assist them in the <laughs> writings of the stories so that they could get a movie out that made sense and Leslie, you, you wrote a book. You wrote a book. So what are your thoughts of this? Like I said, these movies are pumping out. What are your thoughts on a, on a film? Um, I think it's, um, I think it would be viable, as Yolanda said, if we had some type of input. I had a gentleman come to me with this, you know, want to do a screenplay. He wrote a, he wrote a treatment up and he had me sitting on a bus in Port Kaituma. There's no bus in Port Kaituma. It was so sensationalized. And that was my, you know, I've had people come and say, okay, oh, we're going to do a, a, a major director, but I'm going to make it like it's a slave camp in the jungle. You see? And so again, it's been uh, presented, it's been presented to me as, as a project that I, I would not involve myself in. Um, it has to be honest, you know, and, and again, I think eventually it will happen. Um, but I think, um, I'm open to it, but with certainly a lot of, uh, research and conversation, because this is a story that cannot be, you know, I had someone else write me and say, oh, I'm writing about a screenplay about a young girl, 20, uh, black girl from San Francisco, who's going to Jonestown. And my question is, why do you need a fictional character? <laughs> there's, you know, there's people here that are real. Um, so are we, am I open to it? Yes. Under, cer- under certain conditions, because a story I, has to be told and it cannot be told in an hour. It's yes. too much, you know, yes. so a docu-series or like you said, Netflix, where there's, because I do see that next Netflix has, you know, episode one through 10, that's viable, but you cannot tell this story in an hour. You can't tell the story in two hours. There's too many dynamics. There's and don't let the story don't let the story in with just the death of everyone. You have to show 
the folks like Leslie and, and Herbert and others who managed somehow to survive. Because we need to give a message of hope. It can't be that it's all just gloom and doom and it's over with. Oh my God. Uh, both of you all have said that the conditions in Guyana, it was, it was brutal. Uh, uh, elderly people didn't have their, uh, their, their medications. Clearly, Jim Jones was not able to um, have this area where folks could really be uh, taken care of. Did anybody pass away before, before, the, before the murder? Did, any, did anybody die from the, the, br the brutality of living in the jungle? Were there people getting ill and passing away? Yes. Yeah, yes. uh, the first per good. Um, Le uh, Deborah Layton's mother died of cancer. She she passed, um, and so Yolanda, did you know of anyone else? Reverend James Edwards from San passed. Francisco. He passed. Okay. Away. And when we yeah, when we had left, he had only been there for three months. And when we left, he was this man weighed about two hundred and sixty pounds. We went on the trip with him into uh, Georgetown from the United States. And when I saw him the month that we were leaving, he was down to about 150 or 160 pounds. And That's there were so many flies uh, following around him. He couldn't, even, he didn't even have the energy to swat the flies away. And then we found out he had died before the uh, massacre. And then as far as the care of people, I remember treating a member's uh, elderly person who had an ulcer on her foot, which really was almost to the bone. It was a huge ulcer on the top of her foot. And I would try to, you know, I would treat her, you know, treat it, cover it, clean it, um, because these were, these were very common to have ulcers on your body. Um, as far as, uh, people getting sick, yes. Again, I mentioned there were people that were not sent to the Capitol because for, for care because they were considered either they weren't the right person um, or they were considered flight risk. We weren't being taken care of. Um, but again, you know, after the aftermath, um, there was millions of dollars in the bank. $30,000 <laughs> with the social security checks were found in, in, in Jonestown. Um, I had taken a trip in Guyana uh, in February and one of the captains there who was on the airstrip said there was there was there were gut there were gold bars also. There was a lot of resources, even in Jonestown. They just chose, they were trying to starve us to death, basically. You know, a, a friend of mine who's a lawyer uh, asked this question to, I don't even know if y'all can answer it. For the people who sold their homes and uh and and you know their their, their property uh given over to Jim Jones, did any of that go back to the family? Uh, did any of it, did anybody legally, did anybody get their, their mother's property back or their brother's property back? Anything? Well, I know no. for my parents, we had a home that was fully paid off in San Francisco. And one of the homes they sold before we came back. And we never received the money from those, the sale of that home. And just recently, and I'm glad you um, asked this question, I found a document where they had given my parents, I think it was $10,000 for a oh, home man. in San Francisco. Outrageous. But at the wow. time, my parents accepted that. But that's how vulnerable and how entitled they felt they were to do something that despicable to only give my parents $10,000 for a San Francisco home. Mm. And my mother sold a business and property um, and nothing was ever, you know, talked about. There is, I did meet the person who actually said that she notarized all the deeds and mm. sold the property. That book is in the California Historical Society. It will show what property was sold, how much it was sold for, and notarized. So no, we were, they were not compensated for. And I think, and I don't know, and honestly, because of the chaos of this and how this happened, I don't think, and, and, the, and the family members were estranged from, from, from the members that they even knew how to go about this. I, I you know, no. And no I know one helped was, you. No, there was no one. 
you know, we did receive those, those family members that had loved ones die. That was part of the um, distrib distribution from the monies that were found. I always considered it blood money. Um, and it was minimal considering all the money they spent um, to try to get the, the bodies buried, et cetera. But no, there was no, there was no, no one coming to us and saying, oh, by the way, you know, your mother's property, my mother sold two houses and, and, and turned it over to the church. And what's interesting is the people who were involved in the sales of the property and also had the power of attorneys. Those individuals who are white, female and male, Leslie knows who I'm talking about, they live a very luxurious life. In wow. fact, one lives in the Oakland Hills and another one has uh, acres and acres of land in a different <laughs> state. So it's very interesting how they bounced back financially so quickly while we had to struggle. That is that train is never late. That train is of not course, late. of course, of course, there are people who are wealthy off of the massacre of a bunch of black women and children. Of course, of course, that train is never late. This is why this is why I wanted to talk to y'all so bad. So now is as we're in our communities talking about this, this was a black issue and there were black bodies who were exploited, who were taken advantage of, mm -hmm. who were vulnerable and there are people mm -hmm allegedly, reportedly, still living off of that wealth of those black bodies that died in, in Guyana. And we got to have we got to have some compassion for that and not say, why would you go there? What's wrong with y'all? It doesn't make any sense. No, it's much more complicated than that. Y'all being survivors. Um, and again, this goes to anybody who may have survived a cold. I'm curious to know, do y'all communicate? Are you friends or is it too emotional to Hey girl, what's up? Is it too emotional to hang out and chill or is it distant friends? I mean, how, how is it with this community of Jonestown survivors? Because I don't know if it's triggering to be around each other. How, how is that? Miss Yolanda, I see you laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm happy to see you laugh. Yes. I'm happy to see you laugh well, and smile. Well, <laughs> well, for me and Leslie can attest to this, it's been very difficult for me to connect with most of these people because some of them still believe in Jim Jones and some of them I know were stated to be the hit squad. And I mean, it, 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 so I don't need to be connected to them to, to thrive. Um, Leslie and I stay connected because we're on the same uh, thought level and spirituality. So we have remained close to each other once we were able to connect because she was in hiding. I was in hiding as much as I could be. Um, I didn't go to the extent of changing my name, but certainly I wasn't out there consistently telling people who I was and where I was from. So um, that would be my uh opinion on this particular question. I can't believe you said there are still people who believe in Jim Jones. I, I just, that floors me. That's oh, yes. wow. Oh, yes. That's... And they believe in their two minutes before. And I even find myself sometimes I, I, just because it was autopilot that you start your car and you wait two minutes and you meditate before you go. Or, you know, it's ludicrous, but some of those things you find yourself doing on automatic pilot. That was and one of the things he would tell you all to do. Right. And worry about the 16th of every month, because the 16th, the 16th of the month was supposed to be when the big, big earthquake or some catastrophe would happen. So there are certain things that, and I'm sure Leslie can attest to some other things that I may have left off. Wow. I, that, I can't believe anybody. Well, yeah. Uh, what about you, Leslie? Are you able to communicate or, or um, survivors? I, I did for a while. What I found, what I found was the more the more information I learned, the more information I gathered. Um, like uh, they and those that were in that his his um, security Jim was so out of it and on drugs and in Jonestown they had to hold him up to use the bathroom. So I got angry because they knew exactly what was happening. The community didn't know Jim was on drugs. So I, I tried to connect and I did for a while, but what I, the more 
in information I gathered, I realized that these, these were the enablers. Yeah. I, I had to forgive them, but I couldn't, I couldn't be around them. These were the ones that were in Georgetown that knew what was happening, but didn't go to the embassy to say, hey, this is what's happening in Jonestown. So I've forgiven them, but I don't have any, I don't have any need to continue any kind of relationship with them. I just don't. So I uh, read so much and watched so much uh, preparing for these interviews because mm -hmm. I wanted to be as you know knowledgeable as possible and as respectful as possible. But I do want to close with this. Uh, what is something that uh, the people should know that maybe we didn't touch on? Maybe there's a question you haven't been asked. Um, I just want to I just want to give you all the floor for a minute to tell tell us uh, we went through so much and I've learned so much in these two interviews, but. What is something that maybe I'm missing or somebody else out there might be missing when it comes to your stories? Let's start with uh, Miss Yolanda. Well, my closing thoughts would be that um, from being in a cult, I have grown to understand that change has a considerable psychological impact on the human mind. And to the fearful, it is threatening because it means things may get worse. To the hopeful, it's encouraging because things may get better. To the confident, it is inspiring because the challenge exists to make things better. And that's something that was written by King Whitney Jr., which is still relevant and a part of my thoughts and my existence as well as we must become the change that we want to see. And I think through Leslie's and my survival, we are showing and demonstrating that you can survive even when all is given up, all hope is given up. You got to keep on fighting. You got to have the faith. Well said. Miss Leslie? I believe everything comes down to a decision. Um, my decision was to heal and I actively did that. I believe um, that tragedy happens. I will say that we, are, we do have resiliency built within us. We know that after 400 years, we are a people, not just black folks. We are humans that have resiliency built in. But again, it's a, it comes to a decision whether you wanna heal, move forward and do better. Um, I would say that um, go within so you don't have to go without because when you go within and you know yourself and you love yourself, you're not seeking outside approval or outside acceptance, especially in this world of internet and social media. Um, I can say that I have um, excelled in the way that I didn't think. It took me 20 years to, to even begin the process but for those of you that are listening, this can happen to anyone. You have to be very careful um, about uh, who you're connected with, but also we innately have what I call a God sense. Some people say it's the Holy Spirit. I can say it's the Holy Spirit. You, you, are, you have a sense, a, a barometer that will tell you move right or move left. If it doesn't feel good, it's not good. If it's, if, it's, if it's shining with gold, it's too much. Um, but you, we have this within us. We just don't use it. We don't trust our God sense when it is leading us. And if you could get to that point, your decisions will be much better and you certainly won't become you know, in, involved in something as People's Temple. I have one thing to say. People's Temple was not a church. Okay, it's not a church. That's why I don't use the word church. It was under the disciples of Christ to make it legitimate. There was nothing ch about church that was happening in people's temple. Thank you. I wanna say thank you to both of you. Thank you so much. I, I had an idea to do this show. I didn't know how we were gonna find people that would talk. And I'm just super grateful that you could share your stories and y'all keep thanking me, but I encourage y'all to say, send your prayers and love to Miss Yolanda Williams, to Miss Leslie Wagner Wilson. 
I, I really appreciate it. Miss Yolanda, I want you to come back on when we do a show on black police officers. Oh, I love for yes. you to come back on. <laughs> yes, I, 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 we're gonna plan that in the next few weeks. And uh, okay. I just wanna thank y'all and my thoughts and my prayers. And um, yeah, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for, the, for your time. I really God appreciate it. God bless you.